Oh, I was like, where did my stickers go? But it's not my computer, but I was like, where did my stickers go? Yes. Yeah, I'm not 
All right, we're going to get started. Um, everyone is 100% silent um, and, you know, respectful, slash, if you're not, um, have a go. So, uh, I don't want to see or hear anybody's phone. Uh, so, for my uh, junior project, I chose to do the art of business law as a passion of mine. And so, the five things that I'll be talking about were the law of contracts, non-disclosure agreements, trademark infringement, whistleblower laws, and then finally litigation. So from that, I developed my driving question, which was from a legal standpoint, what are the effective methods of keeping a business running? And so first of all, what is business law? So business law includes um, a law of like maintaining order, protecting rights, liberties, and establishing standards, resolving disputes when it comes to business interactions that involves individuals, government agencies, and just other businesses in general. So what are the uh, tasks of a business lawyer? So they include responsibilities of researching cases, drafting uh, contracts, developing diverse corporate uh, procedures, managing budgets, ensuring um, compliance, drafting codes of contact, um, and facilitating corporate uh, mergers. And so first, what are the law of contracts? So contracts are an agreement that specifically uh, enforces your legal rights and tells you what your obligations are, your responsibilities, uh, your responsibilities of you and another party. And it typically involves like a transfer of goods, monies, and or services. And then why are they important? Well, they outline your rights pretty much. They let you know what you can and cannot do in your company and what could get you into trouble and how to stay out of trouble. So these are some examples of contracts. So you have like employee contracts, um, you have lease agreements, insurance agreements, and uh, financial agreements and show and so employment contracts basically underline that you are working for this company and these are the responsibilities and the rights that you have as an employee in this company and then lease agreements are simply agreements that you can use in everyday life just if you're renting a condo and you're living in it or you're renting your house and you're living in it you have lease agreements to ensure that you are the owner of this property for a certain amount of time and then some non-disclosure agreements so what are they? They're just a contract saying that you can't disclose any of your confidential inter information to anybody else, any other company, any other business, or any other person when you're doing a partnership with them. And so there are a couple different types of non-disclosure agreements. You have unilateral, bilateral, and multilateral. Unilater unilateral um, non-disclosure agreements allow you to limit how you and another party can, can share your confidential information. So for example, if I have my own company, I can only disclose what I want to disclose to another person. My uh, CEO or my higher up, whatever it can be, can't disclose any other information but myself. And then bilateral requires both parties to disclose their information. So if I'm, if my business is partnering up with Amazon, Amazon and my company both have to share their confidential information to everybody else. And then multilateral uh, non-disclosure agreements involves three or more parties where only one company can disclose certain informations. So you don't need all three of them, but you just need at least one to disclose confidential company information. And so trademark infringement. So what is it? It's a violation of rights attached to your trademark without the authorization of the trademark that you have um, on an owner of any other license. So if your company experiences trademark infringement, you can potentially lose the um, reputation of your company because it's being formed into someone else's company by a different idea. And so like, for example, if 7-Eleven was trademarked, that would be 7-Super would be like an example. And then same with Puma, if Puma was a, had trademark infringement, that's what it could potentially look like. And so it's important in protecting your brand identity and from other people poaching your ideas and imitating your brand. So fourth, whistleblower laws. What is a whistleblower? It's a person that releases any kind of information that is deemed to be legal, unethical, or um, not correct with the organization that's either public or private. And so can whistleblower laws protect me? So yes, an employee who is engaged in a protection uh, from their company discloses um, like a contract that's free of fear from their other disclosures that they already said. So if they're the whistleblower in your company, they're protected under the Whistleblower Protection Act that was passed in 1898. 
and it protects um, the employees from getting harm from the retaliation of other people saying that you're a whistleblower. And so five, litigation. So what are the basics of litigation? It's pretty much just the process of taking legal action. So court hearings, uh, solving common conflict between companies, and it's through, a, it's through a court hearing, so you're in front of a judge. And so the types of litigation that you can be involved when you're in a company is antitrust acts, bad faith, breach of contracts, class action, like they're called misdemeanors, but in the construction. And so for my project, I kind of created my own pretend business to like, if I were to create a business, what would I use? What contracts would I use? Would I include non-disclosure agreements and that kind of thing? So, but first, how can all this information be helpful to you in the future? It gives you a good understanding of like basic principles of marketing, um, just how our world and business works and how you can make money, how you can get in trouble for making money and that kind of thing. So how can I control my company's business or my company and business to be successful from a legal standpoint, going back to my driving question, which the answer is having contracts, knowing the laws and what I can and cannot do, having a good marketing strategy, strategy trademarking my company and knowing the things that can potentially get me into litigations. And so to go into my company, the things that I thought were important if I were to have contracts were a general business contract just to lay out your responsibilities and roles of each person. And then employment contracts to let you know that if you're my employee, you're employed in this company uh, for this amount of time and these, this is your job and this is what you're doing. And then sales related contracts just to keep track of everything um, that's going on in my company to make sure that nothing gets lost in translation. And then are non-disclosure agreements necessary? They're not necessary, but they're highly recommended because um, it keeps you and your company safe from other people trying to embark on your ideas and your pretty much everything about your company that makes it your company. It's like keeping everything that you have to yourself and not letting anybody else take it from you. And so same thing with trademark infringement, kind of the same idea. It's just it's really easy to do. There's an application that you can have online, like any of you guys, if you like a certain name and you have an idea for this business that you want to create later, you can trademark that name so nobody else can take it from you. And it's super easy to use. It can be a tedious task, but it'll help you in the future. And then how can I get involved in litigation? So how can I stay out of it? That's kind of the main goal of a company. And one of the number one things you need to have when you're creating a company is just to have a good reputation. So be nice to other people. Um, and based if you fail in your company or not, you just need to maintain a good reputation for yourself. And then have all your information, gather it and organize it. Make sure you know what you're getting into before you do it. All the good and the bad and facts take time to develop. So just be patient and know what you're going into. And then be prepared for anything that could come up. Always have a backup plan and always have ways that you can strategize around all the conflicts that you may enter. And then work with the right people. Know who you're hiring. Um, just be aware of your surroundings and who you're having in your company because that can make a big difference in whether it's successful or not is having the right people work with you. And then enter in the right agreements. Don't just sign contracts. Contracts have fine print that are very dangerous, so to say. They can list things that you didn't necessarily know of from before that the person didn't disclose to you. And by signing off on it, you're signing off on everything on that paper. And then have the improper insurance to cover your company. Um, take that hurricane insurance, take all that thing that you can get. So if your company does fall into trouble or get damaged, you have something behind it to protect it. And so furthermore, as my junior project, I took it kind of slow because I wanted to really understand what it meant to become a business lawyer as my passion in the future. That's what I wanted to go into college for. And so next year I hope to create a small brand that I can run from home or my computer that allows me to understand and further develop my ideas and my findings into something so I can, so to say, have a little bit of practice and to know what I want to do. And so that's it. Thank you. Okay, so I've always had a passion for the STEM side of things. I like the sciences, the mathematics, and all the like technologies, advancements, and things like that. 
So I wanted to go into more of a physical thing, a physical internship, something that I can see in my own life. So I did an internship looking at the engineering of mountain bikes. I went down to Lahaina. I went and did an internship at West Maui Cycles. And every day I went there, I worked with the head mechanic and the other mechanic. I worked, worked with the two mechanics there who did projects on replacing things on bikes and we're doing repairs, changing the tires and whatever, basically whatever people needed to have done to their bikes. And uh, the main, my driving question was how has engineering driven advancement in sports by improving the equipment used? So in my essay, I looked at, I looked at the mountain bikes. I looked at surfboards and golf clubs. I saw that they all had one main thing that they had wanted to improve. And in my research, I found that this was making lighter and stronger materials. So a lot of these things, mountain bikes, surfboards, and golf clubs all started using carbon fiber. Mountain bikes use carbon fiber in the frame of the bike. Surfboards use the carbon fiber wrap, and the golf clubs also use the carbon fiber wrap. This is to maintain strength and have a lighter uh, form of use. So in my internship while I was there, I saw three main things that I wanted to focus on. I wanted to focus on this is different kinds of suspensions on the bikes and how they have advanced. I wanted to focus on the braking systems and what different kind of braking systems will affect. And I wanted to focus on the gears and the tires and how these can affect performance of the bikes and how they can be damaged. So first of all, one of the first things that caught my eye when I was in the shop was the different kinds of tail suspensions. So you can see that they all have different looks. So this is, these two are horse link suspensions. And you can see this because they have a connection to the frame and a connection to the suspension. This is a twin link suspension having a connection to uh, another piece down here, a connection to the frame and a connection to the other suspension. So these bikes have uh, many different things which were advanced by the companies themselves. The bike companies saw a need, which was the need for tail suspension. Mountain bikers wanted a smoother ride where they were able to have more control over the bike. So they engineered different ways for this to happen. They made this kind of suspension and I actually rode these two bikes here after they were repaired to see how they felt and what the different suspensions felt like. This suspension felt more like it was dropping towards the ground and the bike was spreading out and this suspension felt more of a just a press down. And so the different suspensions have been engineered to have different feels. This suspension is meant to have more of a it's better for speed and this one is more for technical uh, riding in like rougher terrain in the mountains. This, you can see down here, this is a little piece that's called the dog bone. That is meant to just give an overall smoother ride, whereas this does not have that little piece down in the bottom. So now we're looking at the front suspension. Many people here know what the front suspension is. This is just the piece in the front. It's going to give you a softer ride. Maybe if you're doing a jump, it'll land softer, or if there's something you're rolling over. So you might not know, what you might not know is that the front suspension will actually slow the bike down. The front suspension will absorb energy from the, from the ground and it will make it so the bike cannot gain as much speed as a, a road bike can with no suspension, which is what people have found out. Road bikes do not have any suspension because they don't need it. They need to go faster so they have, because they're just on flat asphalt and concrete. They just need speed so they have no suspension. Then other mountain bikes like mountain bikes need suspension in the front to have to maintain that control so the people don't get thrown over, thrown all over the place when they ride over rocks. So now going into the full suspension versus hardtail suspension. So the engineer, the company saw a need for engineering a tail suspension, but they first came out with a suspension just in the front. The front suspension and no suspension in the tail creates just the smooth. Uh, decently smooth ride. It gives them a little bit of flexibility, but it came, it maintains more speed than a bike over with two, two kinds of suspension. Because you, as I mentioned earlier, the front suspension will absorb energy. The back suspension always does, uh, also does the same thing, making it so that will be, have a slower bike, but that bike will be more, more usable and rideable in on um, worse conditions, bigger rocks and things like that, which is why more mountain bikers uh, sway towards the full suspension side. Now going into the gears. So on the left on the this picture, you see this Yeti bike. This is the gear area for the Yeti bike. That's called the cassette. And what the person, the owner of this bike, 
uh, wanted to replace the cassette and make and the front gear to make it easier for uphill mountain climbs. So I helped with the head mechanic and we replaced the whole cassette in the back and we replaced the front um, gear. The front gear, they wanted to lower from a 32 teeth gear to a 30 teeth gear. And because it's a smaller gear, this will make it so a less of a motion will spin the gear more, making it easier to, for uphill mountain climbs. They also added a bigger gear in the back. And when we, when we were done with this, when we had put the bike back together, we actually found that there was a problem. The chain was slipping when we, when we were switching gears. And the reason for this is because the bottom derailleur was just a slight bit off. It was a quarter inch too far away from the bike, which is not a big, it's not a big measurement, but something as precise as this is going to need to be right on the money. So what it was happening is that at the top, the, gear, the chain could not get all the way up and it would slide off. So it just needed one simple fix. And that was to just loosen a screw and slide it over, which is what the, the engineering of this has made it easier to adjust these things. And you can actually do it yourself at home. All you need is a screwdriver or an Allen wrench and your hands so you can move it over. And also the chains in the past, the, the chain that drives the bike, they were not switched as often as they are now. People have found that the chains at, at themselves will actually stretch out. And when they stretch out, they will start rubbing against the teeth of the bike. And you can see here that a lot of these teeth are a little bit different. And that's because some of them have been rubbed down. And this is what the, the old cassette on this bike was a lot worse looking more like this. But it still works. It can just make it so the bike does not have as much of a, just it does not work as well. So there's actually a measurement thing they use to figure out if the chain is stretched out or not. They place it in one of the links and then drop it. If it, if it does not drop all the, if it drops all the way, then the chain is too stretched out and needs to be replaced. So now we're going into the braking systems. We have rim brakes and we have disc brakes. So rim brakes were the first brakes used and they were, they had just a metal cord going through right through the middle and they squeezed the rim. And what, what people found is that this would actually, in what watery conditions, these, first of all, the chains would rust and the rim brakes would start sliding and would not work as well. So what the company saw is they needed to find a new way to engineer these brakes. So they went to disc brakes and hydraulics. So this brake runs off of hydraulic system and has this disc here. These brakes are able to stop faster and require less maintenance overall. So one of the bikes that came into the shop, which was the bike, one of the bikes you just saw with the disc brakes, this bike needed a new handlebars and they wanted to replace the braking system. So right here, you can see that the, this is a syringe filled with hydraulic fluid. So what we did is we put the braking system on and slid the tubes through the bike. And then we filled the, filled the tubes with the hydraulic fluid. And the, there was actually two syringes. I forgot to take a picture of one, but there was also a syringe right there. And what I was wondering why that, why would there be two syringes and not just one, just one pumping it straight in. And then I realized that I saw the head mechanic pumping it back and forth and pumping it to the back syringe and then to the front syringe. And what I saw is that every time he would pump it back and forth, air bubbles would come out. And when he stopped, finally stopped and was done was when there was no air bubbles. So what I was able to see is that the air bubbles would actually affect the bike in a negative way. It could cause the brakes to not work as well. And it might, it could either make them so they will close on themselves and start closing and breaking when you don't want to, or you won't be able to break as fast as you want to. So now looking at the tires. So the, the, a lot of the bikes in the shop, the rental bikes had those tires right there. Those are just standard road bike tires. They get a lot of grip on flat surfaces and are able to pull the bike through where it needs to go. Then you have other tires, which are better, better for mountain biking. This is like more of a standard mountain bike tire. And then you have tires like this, which have been engineered to run better through the mud. You can see it's a wider tire, with bigger lugs, which are gonna pedal through the mud and grab the mud better than a tire like this would. That would just slide out. Then you can see that there's also tires with bigger lugs on the side. And those are for gravelly situations because when you're riding in gravel and you need to turn, your, bike's, your bike can easily slide out. So what those do is they grab into the dirt more and we'll make it so the bike does not slide out on itself. Then you have this tire all the way on the left. That's for more groomed BMX, professional BMX riders. Those groomed tracks are gonna be, they're gonna be slippery, but they're not gonna be slippery enough to have 
a tire such as a mountain bike tire because they're looking to get more speed. These bigger lugs can actually slow down the bike and make it so they get less speed. That's why a road bike has a flatter tire. So you're able to see here, uh, well actually I'm not sure if you can, but this bike has a smaller tire in the back and a larger tire in the front. So first you need to know what the advantages of a larger tire are. A larger tire is able to get more speed, more traction, and it can get over obstacles easier. And a smaller tire, a smaller tire is able to accelerate faster and it has more agility. So what a biker like this, what they're trying to achieve is the best of both worlds. They have the bigger tire in the front because that's the first tire to go over obstacles. And then they have the smaller tire in the back because that's the tire that moves and starts gets the bike accelerating. And that's the tire that um, is you can throw around. So they're getting enough, they're getting more speed and just getting over and more capability of going in rougher terrain and also more agility and faster acceleration with the smaller tire in the back. So how has, how has this engineering driven advancements in sports by improving equipment? So specifically in biking, engineering has driven to do different kinds of suspension. I did not mention this earlier, but the suspension has changed and has gone from springs and a lot of suspension uses air suspension now. And they have used, changed different kinds of suspension, made new suspensions, putting it in the tail suspension, putting suspension in the front. They have changed the tires, made different tires for different con conditions, found different ways to make the tires, the sizes of the tires better for conditions and change the brakes from just metal cords, which can rust and break to hydraulics, which won't rust because it's a liquid inside. And so for my project next year, I looked this year at the, more the physical side and went and did an internship looking at the physical side of engineering and how the physical things work. So next year, I'm hoping to look at more maybe an electrical side. So I built an, an electric guitar in engineering. So maybe I'm going to try and go do that with a guy down in Lahaina who builds electric guitars. I want to look at the electronics, see how the electronics work and how they, how different electronics will affect it and how different guitars achieve different sounds. And that's it. So, hi, my name is Carter Bozik, and to give you some background on my life, I was born and raised in Chicago, but I moved to Maui when I was eight years old in third grade, which means that I've lived on Maui for eight years. And at a very young age of my life, I noticed that in Maui, there's not much to do unless you enjoy the great wild outdoors. And I realized from a very young age that there are three things that local kids do here. Number one is ride dirt bikes. I don't know, I asked Legend and Cohen to take me dirt biking. They never took me dirt biking. So I never really got into it. The second thing I noticed that all kids love to do was to go surfing. When I was a young kid, I used to surf a decent amount. But as I got older, I gained some weight, I got lazier, I was tired of surfing. And the third thing I realized that all kids do is they like to go fishing. And that was ever since the third grade is something that I've been loving to do for going on eight years. And that has been my passion for majority of my lifetime. And it's something that I want to expand upon further in my life. So I know I had to do a project to incorporate my passion. I know when Mr. James said those words out of his mouth, I had to incorporate my passion, which is fishing and another thing in business. And I love business. So I had to incorporate business. So what two, if I connect the two could come out to be fishing in business? Well, the only thing that I could think of was charter fishing in the Heiner Harbor. Because you take out charters, which is the business side aspect of it, and then you actually go fishing, which is what I like to do. So I realized that I had to take a look and a deeper dive into the sport fishing industry in Lahaina. So for my internship, I needed to find a company willing to take me out with open arms, willing to take me out on the water and deal with my annoying antics. I needed someone to take me, someone I knew. So I asked my friend Tony Nunez to hook me up. And he got me on an internship with automatic sport fishing and my mentor, Jonathan Kelly. And as you can see, um, this is my guy named Johnny. He's a pretty gnarly, gnarly fisherman, as you can see by the photo. It really represents his um, mentality on the water. He just does not care. 
Um, but he's just a super gnarly and hardcore fisherman who taught me a lot of aspects, not only about fishing, but about the business aspect of his company as well, since he is the owner. He taught me minor things like even if he was having a bad day to always keep a smile on his face and be fake towards the customer in order to, you know, get that b- bigger tip and give them the experience they deserve since they're paying thousands of dollars to go fishing. So I'm super blessed that I got to meet my man, Jonathan Kelly. So and then building off of my topic, I needed a driving question to really formulate my research paper and my assignment. So I needed a driving question that would correlate business with Johnny and fishing. So the driving question I came up with was what marketing tools does Jonathan Kelly use to advertise automatic sport fishing in West Maui? And while I was on my internship and while I performed my research paper, this was the main driving question that I kept pegging Johnny on each and every time I went out fishing. So first, we have to talk about business. Business 101 is pretty much marketing. I love marketing, and I love the psychological uh, component uh, behind marketing. That's why I always bug my dad about marketing, so I really want to dive deeper into that with automatic sport fishing. So in automatic sport fishing, during my internship, I noticed that they utilized three main things to attempt to market the product. The first thing they did was they caught fish effectively. And I believe success is the best tool for marketing. If you have success and you have that reputation of slaying fish, you know, and you know what you're doing, and obviously you're going to get people that want to come and join you on your charter fishing experience. The second thing I noticed they utilized was social media to their advantage, as they're the only charter fishing company on the west side of Maui to have a social media, which appeals to the younger generation, such as you guys, because we're always on our phones. So I thought it was pretty cool and unique that they had like Instagram and Facebook, which is something I did not know. And the third thing I noticed they did to incorporate marketing into their business plan was the utilization of taxidermy, which is something that they uh, par- they partnered up with a business called Gray's Taxidermy. And a taxidermy uh, essentially refers to the process when a fish is measured and weighed so that it can get printed and mounted in like this, like here's a marlin. And then you get like the automatic sport fishing plaque, which therefore markets their product because it gives other people recognition of the name in the marketplace. So these were the three main points that I noticed Johnny and his charter fishing company utilized in West Maui. So moving forward, I knew that even in large, large corporations such as Google, um, Apple, Samsung, there's always improvements that can be made in any company. And I knew, and I noticed that there was some room to improve. Although I would say automatic sport fishing is the best charter fishing company in in Lahaina. The tallest man in a group of midges isn't all that tall. So I knew that there was ways to improve in some way, shape or form. So the first thing that I noticed that they did not include was free lunch. And how easy is it to advertise free lunch to the general public of Maui and to the general public of the tourists and tourists that want to come to Maui? It's so easy just to give a person a burger or a sandwich and market that on social media of, you know, like a little girl, like stuffing your face with a sandwich. It's just such an easy marketing tool that I believe that they should incorporate in their business because it will then just create the gap. It will separate them from the rest of the uh, companies even more. And the second thing I noticed that they didn't have was merchandise. How do you not have merchandise or any uniforms when you're out in the water? And if you look at the logo, I mean, it's, it's pretty, it's, a, it's an awesome logo. You see the West Maui Mountains right there. You see a marlin that says automatic sport fishing. So my idea was to make merchandise for them. And then therefore this would allow them to spread their company's name across the world. So then you could, you know, give um, tourists shirts that say automatic sport fishing. And then people would be like, oh, what is that? I like that shirt. Oh, that's automatic sport fishing. I went fishing for them in Maui and we caught, you know, this many fish. And then therefore that would market the product. So these are the two main things that I noticed that they lacked in their company, which is something that I was passionate about and discovering more. Of. So then revisiting my driving question, I did a research paper that I dove deeper on certain topics on that. Um, my driving question again was what marketing tools does Jonathan Kelly use to advertise automatic sport fishing in West Maui? As I previously stated, I did a research paper with three main strands that helped me dive deeper into the subject. The first strand was um, identifying the ancient techniques that John uses to effectively catch fish 
such as Palu Ahi, which again just correlates with success in marketing. The second strand I wanted to incorporate in my research paper was the psychology of incorporating a friendly crew. I mean, it's pretty, it's it's a well-known fact that if you're friendly to people, you're gonna get a better tip, et cetera. And this job's all about making tips. I mean, so you wanna be nice to people to get that higher uh, amount of money in your, in your bag, you know? And selling to markets that promote the charter. And this is just getting your name out there, selling fish to fish markets that have the name of the plaques is automatic sport fishing. And it's just another thing that I wanted to dive deeper in and really find out how much this will affect the business positively or negatively if they have a negative reputation. So as I realized, fishing is a passion of mine as well as uh, business and marketing. Another passion of mine is boating. I like looking at boats. Like, I don't know. I love looking at boats and how beautiful boats look and going on boats and testing them out. And one of the best boats on the islands I know that's built here is Force Marine. Every, every commercial fisherman that I know either has a radin or a force. And force, forces are, it's really a unique company because they're poorly managed, they're poorly run, they lack infrastructure, and they definitely lack marketing. Forces are all word of mouth. There's no marketing whatsoever. They have no social media. They don't advertise in newspapers. They literally don't do anything, but their product, their product is so highly marketable and so awesome that it's all word of mouth. And this means that it takes about five to seven years to order a force because the waiting list is so long because they take so long to make a boat, but they don't even have marketing. Like imagine if this business was properly run with marketing and with the infrastructure that it deserves, it would be a gold mine. And this is why it's a passion of mine to figure out the problem with force marine and make turn it into a booming business uh, for future fishermen to come. So thank you.